Right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos. And today 
I want to talk to you guys about the Italian Renaissance, magic and Kabbalah. So this is going to be the first half of a two-half stream. The second half is going to be over at the website for our beloved website members. So today is going to be fun. And in fact, I think I'm going to have the next few streams are going to dive deeper and deeper into this topic. I think the next one, Friday, we're going to get into planetary and angel magic during the Renaissance. Again, diving and probing a little bit deeper into this topic. This is a topic that is... Uh, close and dear to my heart in regards just to interest, not that I promote it, obviously. We promote Orthodox Christianity here, but um, I think this topic is so fascinating, and there's so many uh, ripple effects that we deal with today in regards to the Italian Renaissance and the, and the the translation of the Corpus Hermeticum, the, the reintroduction of Neoplatonic thought, the humanism of the renaissance all these different things perennialism I, I, we're going to discuss some of this stuff but today this stream is going to be about well it's a sort of a continuation so if you guys remember a few streams ago we were talking about the ancient roots of western magic well that was obviously before the christian period and now when we look at the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, when we look at the post-Council of Florence, again, a council that we don't recognize that was trying to uh, establish and substantiate papal supremacy, so we as Orthodox, obviously, thank God, did not uh, accept the Council of Florence. But that, the Italian Renaissance, post the Council of Florence, the bringing into Western Europe, translating into Latin, the Corpus Hermeticum, Plato, and the re revivication of Neoplatonic thought really spawned what we consider the Western trajectory of magical practices. And so that past stream, the stream on the ancient roots of Western magic, is really talking about that period right before uh, the moving of the capital from Rome to Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire. And what we call the Middle Ages, what is referred to as the Dark Ages, aren't really that dark. It's actually more of a period in which we followed Christ a little bit more. Now, certainly we had feudalism and all this different stuff was going on in Europe, but it's kind of a misnomer. And so, interestingly, that period of at least Western European history, because, it, you know, it, being Orthodox, you always get frustrated how everything's an analysis of Catholicism in Western European history. There's so much more going on. But... Uh, that reintroduction of these practices shows you really this limbo period that in between the, the Byzantine Empire uh, was prominent. Now, when we look into the Italian Renaissance, now we're getting ready to see the fall of the Byzantine Empire due to the Turks. And this reintroduction of all this magical thought, it changes European history. It changes intellectual history. It changes religious history in Europe. It changes what we can, you know, the practicing of Christianity. Everything becomes more magical. Magical spirituality takes on uh, a, a new prominence. And we're going to touch on Kabbalah, the Zohar. What was going on in middle, the Middle Ages in Spain, 13th century Spain, was a great period of syncretism between the Jewish Kabbalists, the mystical Sufic understanding of in Islam. Again, uh, Spain has a very interesting history with Islam, but also then you get the Christians and Christian mysticism. And today we're going to be talking about a person named Giovanni Piccadella Marandola, who kind of emerges not during that time period, obviously, because we're in the 15th century in today's conversation, but that 13th century period in Spain is where we see the syncretic blending of this mystical thought in Islam, this mystical thought in Judaism, and the new mystical thought in Christianity. This leads, these, this is the, one of the basis for what we could consider perennialism. And perennialism emerges out of all these things, and we get what, what we're going to talk about today, the Prisca Theologia, the, the Philosophia Perennis, um, which is, the again, the basis for when we look at the New Age, when we look at most people's presuppositions, how, well, all religions kind of lead to the same mountaintop, we can point to where that idea really gets a hold of the Western European mind. 
And that's the point of today's conversation today is, is the Italian Renaissance, the rise of humanism, the worship of man, the worship of reason. And of course, uh, uh, the liberalized worldly Christianity. We see a new sort of understanding of who Christ is and the purpose of Christianity. It becomes, I would say, a little bit more liberalized, a little bit more worldly, certainly not orthodox, a very different trajectory than our, our Eastern brethren. And so we see um, the idealizing of the pre-Christian antiquity. And so again, I'm going to introduce a gentleman named Gemistus Plethon. Have you heard of him? Well, it's actually, he, he plays a pretty prominent role. He's an important guy that a lot of people haven't heard of. You know, uh, I, uh, to get into today's topic, we're going to even reference, again, how so much of the Islamic mysticism, you know, often you hear people talk about, well, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages in Europe, it was a golden age in Islam, and that's where they still had Plato. They still kept many of the Neoplatonic uh, teachings, you know, of course, our, our, uh, the Byzantine Empire, we shut down all those Neoplatonic academies, all the heretics, get out of here. Uh, but that stuff kind of thrived over in the Islamic world. And so this is where we see the fruitioning of algebra and Sufic mysticism and all these different things. And so we're going to touch on a book that re-entered Europe again through Spain, through the syncretic blending of Islam and Judaism and Christianity, and a book like this, The Secret of Secrets. How many of you have even heard of this book? This was an extremely important book uh, when... Uh, um, influencing Ficino, Marsilio Mer Mer Ficino in the Italian Renaissance. This was a very important work. And so today, again, the point of today, and, and mind you, again, this is the first half. I have a whole PowerPoint I want to share with you guys. If you find this topic interesting, as I do, I, I, I really find this topic interesting because it helps provide a sort of mental schematic, a mental timeline and map of intellectual history, spiritual history in Europe, and many things that affect us today. Many things, again, as we come closer to Christ, as we live in the wake of the Enlightenment presuppositions, and we live in the wake of many of the secret societies, the Masonic, the Rosicrucianism, the you know Hermetic Lodges, well, all this stuff really gets its basis in today's conversation, today's topic, and so all of this stuff, living in the consequences of it, we eventually, most of us, I hope, have come back to Christ through an anatheistic return back to God, back to Orthodox Christianity, of which we have like doctrines like theosis. And the Catholics didn't have theosis. So interestingly, as we'll see today with much of this magical conversation, is things like apotheosis really take hold. This magical idea of the worship of man, again, through the Renaissance humanism, takes hold of the Western mind, and I would argue because it didn't have the, the tenets, the teachings of Orthodox Christianity, of the correct truth of who Jesus Christ is, and the purpose of his incarnation and his defeating of death, and of course, his crucifixion and the dying for our own sins. Now, they don't have a basis for this stuff. And so we see things that seem very true, that resonate with people's souls, like uh, somehow we're supposed to become higher than we are, higher beyond human nature, right? We're supposed to become gods by grace, who Christ is by nature. This is orthodox theology. But if without orthodoxy, pretty soon you're going to end up like Marsilio Ficino, and you're going to be the magical high priest. And I don't think it's any coincidence that Catholicism looks very similar to these things. That, that you know, look at, uh, what, I forget what basilica it is. Maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, I forget, but one of, the, one of the basilicas in Rome has a huge uh, marble floor of Hermes Trismegistus, the, th the thrice great one. Again, you never find that in Orthodox, although, of course, in Orthodox, we, we see a lot of corruption in our hierarchy right now, so we can't be... Uh, we can't idealize ourselves too much, that's for sure. But uh, today's topic, again, I think is really exciting. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to first uh, 
introduce a lot of the important names, the important topics that kind of set the framework for today's conversation. And then I'm going to read uh, the entire chapter of Italian Renaissance Magic and Kabbalah. Now you'll see, if you notice there, you see the spelling's a little bit different. C-A-B-A-L-A. -A -A. Well, that's not K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H. That's not Kabbalah with a Q. All those spellings actually mean different things. And if you subscribe hopefully you enjoy some of the content over here on church of the eternal logos if you go over to the website and become a member well we're going to handle all these things in the second half of today's conversation which i will probably get finished either tomorrow but certainly friday morning so uh and then friday night again i want to continue this conversation let's dive into planetary and angelic magic going on in the renaissance of which i have more powerpoints more deep dive discussions which is going to be for members only at the website so so uh <clears throat> if you would like to become a website member please do so using this link right here this link right here would greatly appreciate it again this is just the first half of today's topic uh today is again i'm assuming the point is to assume you don't know anything and and to give you a strong foundational basis to begin to understand this topic. i've referenced marsilio Ficino and giovanna piccadella marandola so many times and i was last night i was actually just googling or youtubing to see what's out there on this topic and there's not a whole lot there's not a whole lot. There's really the only, uh, it was sadly, the most comprehensive discussion of this topic, I think, is Terrence McKenna. And I did a whole uh, real intricate slideshow of him talking about, of which I've taken all that stuff down. It's all been privated from my previous YouTube channel. And so it's like that was a conversation in favor of many of the things we're going to be talking about. Now, today, I'm, I'm bringing more of an academic critique of the topics at hand. So I thought this is an important, this is an important thing to get into and really provide a sort of basis for people to understand this momentous period in history. So if you'd like to have access to the second half, which is not up yet, I will be doing that probably, like I said, tomorrow. We got multiple one-on-ones. Shout out to everybody who signed up for the one-on-ones. We got multiple one-on-ones scheduled for tomorrow. In fact, if you would like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one to talk about maybe this topic or philosophy or theology or whatever kind of floats your boat, well, you can do so with the link that I just posted in the live chat. And again, thank you, everybody who has signed up. I'm really looking forward to all the conversations tomorrow and some of the conversations Friday, obviously, before, uh, well, not obvious, but we've been uh, very, people have been very gracious in signing up for the one-on-one. -on -one. So we will be, I have a, a, a couple scheduled on Friday as well. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so if you would like to become a website member, please use the link that I've posted in the live chat. Also, please, uh, if you'd like to set up a one-on-one, -on -one, use the link that I've also posted. Uh, if you're going to super chat, unless you prefer YouTube, again, do however you prefer. But if you could, please use the uh, Streamlabs link that is, all, that is posted. It's pinned at the top of the comment section. Uh, we have uh, some great moderators who are also sharing that link in the live chat. And if you, uh, if you want to, it's also in the <coughs> video description. Now, I have one more little thing that I want to highlight is that today... Again, we're going to be, this is Wednesday, and so I've mentioned it in a previous stream, but now we are uh, open to the public that at 7 o'clock tonight, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesdays, I aid my godfather, Subdeacon Mark, in a theology course that we dive into Orthodox theology. We're working through this book right here, The Hymn of Entry. And so, do uh, get having the permission of our priest, Father Athanasius. We are now for the last, this will be the fourth week now that it is open up to the public. So, if you would like to join our Zoom meeting on Orthodox Christian theology, it's a two-hour Zoom meeting from seven to nine o'clock every Wednesday night Eastern Standard Time. You can do so by, be, by going over to the group chat, the Codal group chat, and here I'll share that link tree. You can go to the Codal group chat, and at 7 o'clock or 5 minutes till 7 o'clock, I'll be posting the Zoom link. That's the only way to get the Zoom link. The only way to get the link to get into our 
sort of private but now publicly private <laughs> Zoom meeting on Orthodox theology. We've been having about 12 to 15 people join. It's a lot of fun. Again, if you're there to argue, if you're to debate, well, I'm going to kick your ass out straight. It, the point is to listen. The point is to ask in-depth questions. This is to grow in our faith with Christ, to grow in our understanding of Orthodox theology. So that, be, that is tonight, again, at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you'd like to join the Orthodox Theology Zoom meeting, you can do so by joining the Codal group chat on Telegram, the Codal group chat on Telegram. That link will be posted somewhere between 6.55 p.m. and 7 o'clock p.m., and then you guys can hop in. It's, uh, it's, it's just a time to learn. I know Subdeacon Mark would, be, would uh, be thrilled to have any newcomers if you are interested. Okay, so now let's get into our topic today, the topic at hand. First thing I want to talk to you guys about, again, is sort of setting the stage of the pre-Renaissance influence. Now, I'm not going to dive too deep into what we talked about in the ancient roots of Western magic. If you're not familiar, if, you're, if you'd like to learn more and you're not too familiar with the ancient roots, the pre-Christian roots of magic that gets re-substantiated in Europe during today's period, the Italian Renaissance, go back to that stream. It's like, uh, I don't know, like three or four streams ago. I'm not sure. You'll see it. Um, but leading up to the Italian Renaissance, we see Islamic philosophy and mysticism really grab and hold, uh, uh, influence Europe. And so the Arab Muslims invade Spain in 711. So in uh, uh, 711 AD, in the 8th century, Spain becomes Muslim. I'm sure some of you already knew that. Um, maybe it's new for some of you guys. But they permit Jewish and Christian worship and rap rapidly they absorb the esoteric sciences of Egypt and Chaldea, both of which play important roles in the ancient roots of Western magic. Astrology, alchemy, uh, ritualistic magic, this type of stuff. We've talked about hermeticism. If you've read the Hermetic Corpus, you're going to be familiar that... Um, you're going to be familiar that Hermes is talking to Asclepius about how to animate statues. How do you draw the, what we would consider demons? Uh, how do you draw the spirits from the stars and animate statues? Well, Hermeticism was interested in this. And this goes back to ancient rituals and magical practice coming out of Egypt. Hermes, again, prefigured by Thoth, uh, wisdom deities, language deities, you name it. Mercury over in the Roman pantheon. Uh, so... Islam very much absorbed many of these things in what we would consider Islamic mysticism. And when the Muslims took over Spain in 711 AD, well, they allowed the, the Jews and the Christians to continue their worships. And we see now this new historical process of a blending of all these sort of ma magical and mystical ideas. And this produced an esoteric philosophy, Islamic esoteric philosophy from the 8th century forward. And again, if you, you can listen to Jay Dyer, he's done great works on uh, apologetics, orthodox apologetics against the Muslims, that Islam is tricky. You know, most of the people who aren't sophisticated in this, again, nuance is everything, people. Nuance sets you free. But if you're not familiar, you probably don't know that there isn't just some single orthodox uh, Islamic theology, that there's so many schools, there's so many interpretations. The Sufis, now, you know, now we got Wahhabism uh, coming out of, well, I don't need to talk to you about Israel and Saudi Arabia and some of the uh, Western intelligence powers. We'll leave that aside. Maybe that's something more for the members only content. We know how that can get controversial here on YouTube. But um, the translation of Arabic alchemical texts in Spain were the gateway for alchemical philosophy into Europe. And so as we see today, after the Italian Renaissance and this promotion of magic and Kabbalah, alchemy really gets going uh, post. So again, we've talked about it before, the 16th century is the most magical century in European history. People think, oh, the older they were, the more magical they were. Not necessarily the case. 16th century Europe was the most magical century in European history, Western European history, really East and Western European history, the 16th century. And so we get figures like John D. John D. We get Michael Meyer, the, the magical engravings. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that stuff, but um, Paracelsus, 
right? This is this is stuff is uh, 16th century moving forward, and so alchemy really takes a hold, really takes a hold um, after this period. So the Emerald Tablets, the Picatrix. How many of you have even heard of the Picatrix? This influenced Ficino's Marsilio Ficino's Renaissance Magic, and of course this Al Arabic book right here, The Secret of Secrets. The Safir al -As Asrar. Again, I'm I'm going to be butchering every single Arabic and Jewish name today, but you're probably used to it at this point. And so, it's an important for the medieval Islamic alchemical text on the Iberian Peninsula. And then e the easy commingling of the three Abrahamic traditions in late medieval Spain creates a context for highly similar approaches to esoteric readings and sacred script. Why is that important? Because these similar approaches, they focus on immortality. They divinize man. And all these things set the basis for what is going to become called the Prisca Theologia. So let's get into some of these, some of these important topics that I want to share with you. So the first one, again, to set our conversation that, yes, I'm using Wikipedia because I'm just trying to introduce these concepts to you guys if you haven't heard of them. And you can dive deeper now. I give you the words. I give you the context, the, the vocabulary. So now you can do your own duck duck go searches you know watch out for google uh i i use the brave browser and duck duck go myself but prisca theologia is the doctrine that asserts that a single true theology exists which threads through all religions and which was anciently given by god to man now again we just talked about how the islamic mystics were okay with grabbing the egyptian text her hermeticism the neoplatonism the chaldean magic and it took over Spain, and now it's blending with the Jewish and Christian mystical understandings. And we're going to see the Zohar, an important text for Jewish Kabbalah. And, and just FYI, I do reject the authenticity of the Zohar. Uh, if you are a proponent of it, you believe that this is part of the oral tradition of the Old Testament, going back to Ezekiel. I do not believe that. I believe, again, this is part of the syncretic mixing of all these different traditions and that it's a historically contextualized phenomenon, but that's a whole nother academic discussion in and of itself. So the term Prisca Theologia appears to have been first used by Marsilio Ficino in the 15th century. Again, that's today's topic. Ficino and a gentleman who we will introduce here in a bit, Giovanni Piccadella Marandola, endeavored to reform the teachings of the Catholic Church by means of the writings of the Prisca Theologia which we, they believed was reflected in Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, and the Chaldean oracles, among other sources. Ficino saw himself as a member of a venerable sequence of interpreters who added to a store of wisdom that God allowed progressively to unfold. Each of these Prisci Theologiae, or ancient theologians, had his part to play in discovering, documenting, and elaborating the truth contained in the writings of Plato and other ancient sages, a truth to which these sages may not have been fully privy, acting as they were as vessels of divine truth. The Enlightenment tended to view all religion as cultural variations of a common anthropological theme. However, the Enlightenment, which tended to deny the validity of any form of revealed religion, held very little esteem the idea of the Prisca Theologia. The doctrine of, the, of a Prisca theologia is held, among others, the Rosicrucians. And so, Christian Rosencrantz, uh, again, that's a whole nother topic. That will be another stream eventually. I know you guys, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Others are maybe scratching your head. Prisca theologia is distinguishable from the related concepts of the perennial philosophy. Again, perennialism itself, which we are saturated with in the contemporary period, we can point to this period, the Italian Renaissance, the commingling of Islamic, the Abrahamic faith, the bringing in Hermeticism translated from the, from the East, or yes, I'm sorry, yes, from the East into Western Europe with the Chaldean uh, understandings of astrology and the Neoplatonic understandings of theurgy, developed this perennial philosophy, right? The, the, the philosophy of all philosophies. Although some inadvertently use the term interchangeably, an, esen an essential difference is that Prisca Theologia is understood as existing in pure form only in ancient times, 
and has undergone a process of continuous decline and dilution throughout modern times. And this is the classicism of the Renaissance, is that like us now, I'm <laughs> saying, you know, recognizing the degeneracy and the ills of our contemporary society, they wanted to get back to antiquity. They, they've sort of idealized antiquity. And so they wanted to get back closer to where this believed Prisca Theologia was more pure. It was more pure. And so they wanted to get back really to this theology that was pre-Christian. In other words, the oldest religious principles and practices are held to be, in some sense, the purest. The older, the better. This is part of the classicist mind. The perennial philosophy theory does not make the stipulation and merely asserts that the, quote, true religion periodically manifests itself in different times, places, and forms. Both concepts, however, do suppose that there is such a thing as a true religion and tend to agree on the basic characteristics associated about this. So Prisca Theology, a very important term and concept for today's conversation. Now, tied with the Prisca Theologia is going to be the elevation of man, the re, a new anthropological understanding. Now, from an Orthodox Christian context, again, the point of mankind the whole time was to be gods by grace. That which God is by nature, we can become by grace through the process of theosis, by the engaging with his uncreated energies. Now, that theological doctrine was lost in the West. And in so doing, as we've talked about before, their atonement theology gets developed, which takes on a much more penal, substitutional framework. Therefore, man is demonized. He, he's brought down to a lesser level. He's not the sort of epitome of God's creation. God says creation is good. We are made in the image of God. Adam names the animals. We have dominion. We have a high status within our Orthodox theology. Unfortunately, in the West, though, of course, they have aspects of this, true, but they don't have theosis. They don't have the, the concept of becoming gods by grace, and so man gets brought down to a much lower status, allowing for Renaissance humanism to get, in, to get going, where now man takes a higher status, and it's so appealing. It's not like that old Christian stuff that demonizes us. No, we can get away from the Christian stuff. Let's move towards humanism. And so when we look back then to the Neoplatonism and the Hermeticism and the Chaldean oracles, well, that looks like it has much more of a humanistic bent to it. And therefore, you can see the logic, the thought process for many of these Renaissance um, thinkers. And so what is Renaissance humanism? It was a revival in the study of classical antiquity, at first in Italy and then spreading across Western Europe in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. During the period, the term humanist referred to teachers and students of the studia humanitatis, meaning the humanities, including grammar, rhetoric, history, poetry, and moral philosophy. It was not until the 19th century that this began to be called humanism instead of the original humanities. And later, by the, um, the retronym Renaissance humanism to distinguish it from later humanist developments. During the Renaissance period, most humanists were religious, so their concern was to, quote, purify or, and renew Christianity, not to become more like orthodoxy because of their presupposition that somehow orthodoxy itself, as time moves forward, we've lost We've moved away from the purest form of theology, which is the oldest theology. So again, in their presupposition, the older the better. The older it is, the more pure it is. So when they wanted to reform Christianity, when they wanted to reform the Catholic West, going back to the Eastern Orthodox wasn't even a thought because, well, they began at the same time as we did in the Catholic West. we got to go older. we got to go back to the original theology, which is really, again, this magical understanding. Their vision was to return to the simplicity of the New Testament, bypassing the complexities of medieval theology, which, again, in the West is scholasticism, and to a degree you can understand why they want to get away from a lot of that stuff. Today, by contrast, the term humanism has come to signify a worldview which denies the existence or relevance of God, or which is committed to purely secular outlook. And this is not what they believed. You see, when we talk about Renaissance humanism, really, they believed what the Hermetic texts describe. 
And the Hermetic texts believe that man was the measure of all things. And again, in orthodoxy, we can understand this to a degree, to a degree. But the Renaissance humanism takes it a little bit further. Renaissance humanism was a response to what came to be depicted by later Whig historians as the narrow pedantry associated with medieval scholasticism. Humanists sought to create a citizenry able to speak and write with eloquence and clarity and thus capable of engaging in the civic life, communities, and persuading others to virtuous and prudent actions. And to a degree, we can, understand, we can all get on board with that. Um, for more of us to be able to read and write and understand the correct use of language, understand what human logic is, uh, understand the purpose of rhetoric and how that works, we can, we can get on board. Humanism, while set up a small elite who had access to books and education, was intended as a cultural mode to influence all of society. It was a program to revive the cultural legacy, literacy, uh, and moral philosophy of classical antiquity. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, let's see here. I thought there might have been something else I wanted to share with you. Here we go. Uh, so the Neoplaton, the Neoplatonic reemergence again during this period is that Renaissance Neoplatonists, such as Marsilio Ficino, who again we're going to bring up here in a second, whose translations of Plato's works into Latin were still used into the 19th century and attempted to reconcile Platonism with Christianity, according to the suggestions of early church fathers Lactantius and St. Augustine. In this spirit, Piccadilla Marandola, who again we will talk about more here in a second, attempted to construct a syncretism of religions and philosophy with Christianity, but his work did not win favor with the church authorities who rejected it because of his views on magic, because it was very sympathetic to magic. It was very, very much sympathetic to that stuff. And so, ironically, and I've said this before, there's always been a sort of homoerotic element associated with the practice of magic. Not always, but even during in my in my western esoteric uh course at berkeley at the gtu uh many students who were interested and promoted these activities they also believe that piccadilla marandola giovanni piccadilla marandola who was an extremely smart young man came from a wealthy family uh he died because he was caught sleeping with another man and so he dies, I think, in his early 30s, in his early 30s. And, and so he's going to be an essential player in, the, in what we would call Christian Kabbalah. He really develops it. He's kind of the founder of, again, what we would call Christian Kabbalah. And Kabbalah, Christian Kabbalah is spelled differently. It's C-A-B-A-L-A. -A -A. You know, I spelt it the Jewish way in the title just so people, I could already see everybody tell me, you spelt Kabbalah wrong. All right. So anyways... Moving next to another important topic is Neoplatonism. And we've talked about, again, if you're not too familiar with Neoplatonism, just go back to uh, the ancient roots of Western magic. I talk a little bit more about that in that one. So we're going to skip. We're not going to read the whole introduction here on Wikipedia to Neoplatonism, but I am going to bring it back down here to, um, to the Western Renaissance. And so, because that's what we're focusing on today. And so, Neoplatonism ostensibly survived in the Eastern church, Christian Church as an independent tradition and was reintroduced in the West by Pletho. Again, and we're, I'm going to talk more about this guy, Gamistus Pletho, very important person that a lot of people haven't heard of. An avowed pagan and opponent of the Byzantine church. He was. He, he was all about uh, Greek magic and Greek philosophy. He, he loved Greek culture, but he wasn't a fan of Greek Christianity, the Byzantine Empire. Inasmuch as the latter, under Western scholastic influence, relied heavily upon Aristotelian methodology. Pletho's Platonic revival following the Council of Florence largely accounts for the renewed interest in Platonic philosophy which accompanied the Renaissance. Quote, all of the students of Greek in Renaissance Italy, the best known are the Neoplatonists who studied in and around Florence. Again, and that's Florence is going to be the point in which we focus today. Neoplatonism was not just a revival of Plato's ideas. It is all based on Plotinus's created synthesis. Again, the Enneads. If you're familiar with 
Plotinus, the sort of, again, father of Neoplatonism, his famous student Porphyry, Plotinus actually didn't write anything down. It was his student Porphyry who wrote everything down in a book called the Enneads, the Nines, which again traces its ideas back to ancient Egypt, again, regarding all this magical stuff and oneness. Anyways, um, created synthesis, which incorporated the works and teachings of Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, and other Greek philosophers. The Renaissance in Italy was the revival of classic antiquity, and it started at the fall of the Byzantine Empire, who were considered the, quote, librarians of the world, unquote, because of their great collection of classical manuscripts and the number of humanist scholars that resided in Constantinople. Neoplatonism and the Renaissance combined the ideas of Christianity in a new awareness of the writings of Plato. Marsilio Ficino was chiefly responsible for packaging and presenting Plato to the Renaissance. And 1462, Cosimo de' Medici, a patron of the arts, and, and the Medici family, uh, his son Lorenzo takes over after Cosimo dies. Uh, I've said this before, extremely, extremely wealthy family. Um, you know, during the 15th century, we have Cosimo and Lorenzo. Really, after moving into the 16th century forward, the Medicis tend to take over the papacy. They start to become Catholic popes. But before that, they were mercantilist. And, and Cosimo de' Medici, I mean, he rivaled only the emperor of China in wealth. So these, this family had tremendous power and tremendous wealth. So it says Cosimo de' Medici, patron of arts, who had an interest in humanism and Platonism, provided Ficino with all 36 of Plato's dialogues in Greek for him to translate. However, between 1462 and 1469, Ficino translated these works into Latin, making them widely accessible, as only a minority of people could read Greek. And between 1484 and 1492, he translated the works of Plotinus, making them available for the first time in the West. What it doesn't mention is that Cosmo de' Medici, what he was really, really interested in was Hermeticism. And so at the same point, we get, or they get, the Corpus Hermeticum for the first time in the West. Now, it was survived in the East, and it was brought over. And so Cosmo de' Medici, who's funding all this stuff, who, who's paying for all these Platonic academies to be built, and Marsilio Ficino, who's leading the translation project, he says, stop with Plato and start translating the Corpus Hermeticum. They wanted to know what Hermes said, because there's a fundamental presupposition. Again, remember, what is Prisca the, This idea that it, the older it is, the better it is. And when they had access to what we would call Hermeticism, the Corpus Hermeticum, they believed Hermes Trismegistus was the oldest philosopher in human history, and therefore he had the purest theology. Again, the older, the better. Many people debated this. They thought Moses was the oldest philosopher of humankind. And so this revolutionized the way people thought. They thought, oh, Moses was the oldest, and therefore let's read you know, Moses. Let's listen to Moses, let's, which revalidates Christianity. But with the introduction of the Corpus Hermeticum, all of, all of a sudden it's Hermeticism. And Hermes Trismegistus, he's the oldest philosopher of mankind, therefore we need to translate that immediately and figure out what that says. And that's going to, it's going to pr uh, promote magic, it's going to promote humanism, it's going to uh, uh, promote an entirely different paradigm than what Christianity uh, calls for. And so Giovanni Piccadilla Marandola was another Neoplatonist during the Italian Renaissance. He could speak and write Latin and Greek, and he had knowledge on Hebrew and Arabic, the Pope banned his works because they were viewed as heretical, which they were, unlike Ficino, who managed to stay on the right side of the church because he was, he was the sort of uh, worker bee for Cosmo de' Medici. And, well, the Pope loved the Medicis because they're the ones that are paying to build all the churches. And so, as you see, what, where the money is, uh, you know, the, the institutions that exist are funded by where the money is in society, and then they begin the feedback loop that the institutions, because they depend on the wealthy, begin to justify the means of the wealthy. And we, we now exist in that same dynamic today, right? That the wealthiest people in the world, the billionaire class, has taken over the institutions of our societies, and now those institutions justify the ideas and in the existence of the billionaire class. 
again, we're all plebs. Well, this is the same thing. This was also true during the Renaissance. Nothing new. The efforts of Ficino and Pico to introduce Neoplatonic and Hermetic doctrines into the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church has recently been evaluated in terms of attempted Hermetic Reformation, and so it has been. So what is Hermeticism then? Well, let's get over here. And so Hermes, I, I basically, again, if you want to learn more about this, you can look it up yourself, Hermeticism. I'm just going to jump down to the Renaissance uh, so we can get going eventually into the reading of the book that I want to share with you guys. And so Plutarch's mention of Hermes Trismegistus dates back to the first century, uh, says CE, but we don't use those nomenclatures, A.D., A.D., first century A.D., and Tertullian, uh, Iamblichus, and Porphyry were all familiar with Hermetic writings. After centuries of falling out of favor, Hermeticism was reintroduced to the West when, in 1460, a man named Leonardo de Can Candia Pistoia brought the Corpus Hermeticum to Pistoia as one of the many agents sent out by Pistoia's ruler Cosimo de' Medici to scour European monasteries for lost ancient writings. And this is in 1960, in 1614, Isaac Casabon, this is very, very important. This is a very important point in the, again, Prisca Theologia, the older the better. Well, eventually this gentleman, as, as we'll read here, Isaac Casabon, He's a philologist, and he he does he's a little bit skeptical this idea that Hermes Trismegistus is the oldest philosopher in humankind, and so what does he do? He starts doing philological work on the Corpus Hermeticum in the original Greek, and what does he come to the conclusion of? Well, this stuff's post-Christian. There's no way that Hermes Trismegistus is older than Moses, because this stuff actually uh, postdates Christianity and Christ Himself. And this revolutionizes this whole project of Hermeticism because for, for uh, basically about a hundred years, a little over a hundred years, the presupposition of Europe was that this Hermes Trismegistus was the oldest philosopher of mankind. That again, his, his philosophy, his theology, Hermeticism, was the true revelation of God given to man. And everything else has been a sort of diminutive form since then. But Isaac Casabon says, uh, no, actually, if you start looking at the Greek words here, 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 uh, we're going to be dating back between the 1st century A.D. to the 4th century A.D. That's when all this stuff got going. And this, again, was a huge, huge deal. So in 1614, Isaac Casabon, a Swiss philologist, analyzed the Greek Hermetic text for linguistic style. He concluded that the writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus were not the work of an ancient Egyptian priest, but in fact dated to the 2nd and 3rd and 4th centuries A.D. Even in light of Casabon's linguistic discovery and typical of many adherents of Hermetic philosophy in Europe during the 16th and 17th century, Thomas Brown, in his Religio uh, Medici, confidently stated the severe schools shall never laugh at me out of the philosophy of Hermes, that this visible world is but a portrait of the invisible, unquote. As above, so below. As within, so without. The famous hermetic adage. Even in, um, in 1678, however, flaws in Casabon's dating were discovered by Ralph Cudworth, who argued that Casabon's allegation of forgery could only be applied to three of the 17 treatises contained within the Corpus Hermeticum. Moreover, Cudworth noted Casabon's failure to acknowledge the codification of these treatises as a late formulation and a pre-existing oral tradition. According to Cudworth, the text must be viewed as a terminus ad quam. Lost Greek texts and many of the surviving Vulgate books contain discussions of alchemy clothed in philosophical metaphor. In 1922, in 1924, I'm sorry, Walter Scott placed the date of the Hermetic text shortly after 200 A.D., but uh, Philander's Petri placed their origin between 200 and 500 B.C. Again, very controversial. Most people believe this stuff is A.D., and it's a syncretic mixing of Greek, Egyptian, Chaldean, different magical ideas. But... Moving out of the, uh, again, moving out of the uh, ancient period, there's a book that really gets going. So then we, let's change our focus over to Kabbalah and Judaism. And there's a book that's really important called the Zohar. 
the Zohar. Now, if you are a proponent of Jewish Kabbalah, you're going to say that the Zohar is just the codification of an ancient oral teaching dating back to Ezekiel, and that this is part of the true Judaism. Now, if you don't believe it is, you think that this is a, a, a process that gets going in the 13th century Spain, which again, mixing with the Muslims dominating Spain, controlling Spain, allowing these schools of thought between Jewish mysticism, Christian mysticism, and Islamic mysticism to thrive. And so the Zohar is a foundational work in the literature of Jewish mystical thought known as Kabbalah. It is a group of books including commentary on the mystical aspects of the Torah, the five books of Moses, and scriptural interpretations as well as material on mysticism, mythical cosmogony, mystical psychology. The Zohar contains discussions on the nature of God, the origin and structure of the universe, the nature of souls, redemption, the relationship of ego to darkness and true self, the light of, and the, to the light of God. Its scriptural exegesis can be considered an esoteric form of the rabbinic literature known as the Midrash, which, elaborate, which elaborates on the Torah. And so the Zohar first appears as a book in Spain, as I've said, during the Kingdom of Leon in the 13th century, the 1200s. It was published by a Jewish writer named Moses de Leon. The Leon ascribed the work, and I'm sure I'm butchering these names, so I apologize. Again, bear with me. I'm an American. I'm just an ignorant, ignorant American. Ascribed the work to Shimon Bar Yochai, the Rashbi, a Tana active after the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the destruction of the Second Temple during the protracted period known as the Jewish Roman Wars. According to Jewish legend, and that's exactly what it is, it's a legend promoted by the people who promote Kabbalah being an ancient Jewish practice. Shimon hid in a cave for 13 years, studying the Torah, and was inspired by the prophet Elijah to write the Zohar. This accords with the traditional claim by adherents that Kabbalah is the concealed part of the oral Torah. Now, this is debated. Again, unfortunately, we live in a period where most people promote this stuff, and they're not going to give you a sort of critical analysis of it. So... Uh, not, not, not the belief of everybody, that's for sure. Now, we're going to move down here again. If you want to learn more about the Zohar, you can look it up yourself. The Zohar spread among the Jews with remarkable swiftness. I'm, I'm reading right here for those uh, still following. Scarcely 50 years had passed since its appearance in Spain before it was quoted by many Kabbalists, including the Italian mystical writer Menahem Recanti and Todros Abul Abulafi, Abulafia, sorry. Certain Jewish communities, however, such as the Dordame, uh, again, I'm totally butchering that, we'll just say Western Sephardic, Spanish and Jew Portuguese Jews, some of the Italian communities never accepted it's, it as authentic because I don't. I don't accept the Zohar as authentic all the way dating back to, uh, you know, post uh, right, right after the death of Christ. Come on. The manuscripts of the Zohar are from around the 14th to 16th centuries, so late Middle Ages. By the 15th century, its authority in the Spanish Jewish community was such that Joseph Ibn Shem Tov drew from it arguments in his attack against Maimonides. And even representatives of non-mystical Jewish thought began to assert its sacredness and invoke its authority in the decision of some ritual questions. In Jacob's and... Uh, Brody's view, they were attracted to its glorification of man. Aha, humanism. Oh, interesting. So the Zohar glorifies man. Its doctrine of immortality. Aha, one of the central yearnings of all magical practice and its ethical principles, which they saw as more in keeping with the spirit of Talmudic Judaism then are those taught by the philosophers in which are held in contrast to the views of Maimonides and his followers who regarded man as a fragment of the universe whose immort immortality is dependent upon the degrees of development in his active intellect. The Zohar instead declared man to be the Lord of creation whose immortality is solely dependent upon his morality. Conversely, Elijah uh, Del Mendingo and 
again, I'm not, I'm not going to pronounce that, endeavor to show that the Zohar could not be attributed to Shimon Bar Yochai as a number of arguments, by a number of arguments. He claims that if it were his work, the Zohar would have been mentioned by the Talmud, as has been the case with other works in the Talmudic period. He claims that had Yo Bar Yochai known by divine revelation the hidden meanings of the precepts, his decisions on Jewish law from the Talmudic period would have been adopted by the Talmud, that it would not contain the names of rabbis who lived at a later period than that of Bar Yochai. He claims that if the Kabbalah were revealed doctrine, there would have been a divergence of opinion among the Kabbalists. Believers in the authenticity of the Zohar countered the lack of references to the work of Jewish literature was because Bar Yochai did not commit his teachings to writings but transmitted them orally to his disciples over generations until finally the doctrines were embedded, embodied in the Zohar. Again, and so we don't need to go any further, but you see what I'm getting at. Now, another important book for those of you who hadn't is the Picatrix. The Picatrix, and I'm not going to dive too deep into this one or read much about it, but it's a 400-page book on magic and astrology originally written in Arabic. Again, we open today's conversation by talking about how much Islamic philosophy and mysticism during the Middle Ages influenced the Renaissance in Europe. Because again, the older the better. And much of this mystical writings they believed to go back to the ancient periods. And this is another book that they loved, The Secret of Secrets. Now, again, if you want to learn more about the Picatrix, check it out yourself. But a gentleman that we talked about of great influence upon the Renaissance was this guy who was antagonistic to the Byzantine Empire. And his name was Gemistus Pletho. And so Georgius Gemistus Pletho uh, lived somewhere between 1355, 1360 to 1452, 1454, was one of the most renowned philosophers of the late Byzantine era. He was a chief pioneer of the revival of Greek scholarship in Western Europe. As revealed in his last literary work, the Nomoi, or Book of Laws, which was only circulated among close friends. He rejected Christianity in favor of a return to the worship of classical Hellenic gods mixed with ancient wisdom based on the Zoroaster and the Magi. Again, Zoroastrianism. And we know, so Zoroastrianism, the religion of fire coming out of ancient Persia. And what does Scripture tell us? That, again, it was three Magi who we believe were Persians who saw creation itself celebrated the incarnation of God, the Logos, by coming to the birth of Jesus Christ and giving frankincense, myrrh, gold, this type of stuff to the newborn king. Um, so Zoroastrianism, ancient Persia, known in, for their incredibly in-depth knowledge of astrology, of astrology. He reintroduced Plato's ideas to Western Europe during the 1438 1439 Council of Florence, of which, again, thank God we rejected. That was a political coup, if you will, to try to get the East to end the schism by adopting papal supremacy. Think, and, we, and unfortunately, we see the same sentiments happening in the contemporary period by all these damn ecumenical hierarchs in the Orthodox Church. Lord, forgive me. It's hard, it's hard not to get angry when you rediscover orthodoxy, you want to defend it, you want to celebrate, and you see how corrupt so much of our hierarchy is, but neither here nor there. The Council of Florence, a failed attempt to reconcile the East-West Schism. Their plethon met and influenced Cosimo de' Medici to found the new Platonic Academy, which under Marsilio Ficino would proceed to translate into Latin all of Plato's works, the Enneads of Plotinus, and, of course, the Corpus Hermeticum. So uh, here we'll just read this little section on Pletho and the Renaissance. Pletho, at an invitation of some Florentine humanist, he set up a temporary school to lecture on the differences between Plato and Aristotle. Few of Pla Plato's writings were studied in the Latin West at the time, and he essentially reintroduced much of Plato to the Western world, shaking the domination which Aristotle, scholasticism, Catholic scholasticism, always think Aristotle, had come to exercise on Western European thought in the High and Later Middle Ages. Marsilio Ficino's introduction to the translation of Plotinus had traditionally been interpreted to the effect 
that Cosmo de' Medici attended Pletho's lectures and was inspired to found the Academia Platonica in Florence, where Italian students of Pletho continued to teach after the conclusion of the council. However, according to James Hankins, Ficino was misunderstood. In fact, communication between Pletho and Cosimo de' Medici, for whose meeting there is no independent evidence, would have been severely constrained by the language bearer. Furthermore, Ficino's Platonic Academy was more of an informal gymnasium that did not have a particularly Platonic orientation. Nevertheless, Pletho came to be considered one of the most important influences on the Italian Renaissance. Marcillo Ficino, the Florentine humanist and the first director of the Academia Platonica, said Plethon the ultimate honor, calling him the second Plato, while Cardinal Basarion speculated as to whether Plato's soul occupied his body. Oh, a transmigrationist understanding of the souls, do we, with Cardinal Basarion? Interesting. Plethon may also have been the source of Ficino's Orphic system of natural magic, which is will be mentioned today in our reading. While still in Florence, Pletho wrote a volume titled Wherein Aristotle Disagrees with Plato, commonly called De Differentis. To correct the misunderstanding he had encountered, he claimed that he had written it without serious intent, was incapacitated through illness to comfort myself. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I, yeah, we can move on. So, no, n no more. So, okay. Now the next gentleman that's important. Again, if you're not familiar with Marsilio Ficino, check him out. Learn who he is. We're not going to read much. I'll just read his little opening split here. Um, he lived from 1433 to 1499, was an Italian scholar and Catholic priest who was one of the most influential humanist philosophers of the early Italian Renaissance. He was an astrologer, a reviver of Neoplatonism in touch with major academics of his day, and the first translator of Plato's complete extant works into Latin. His Florentine Academy, an attempt to revive Plato's Academy, influenced the direction and the tenor of the Italian Renaissance and the development of European philosophy. Okay, so again, we'll be talking more about Ficino here. I'm not going to read more of this. And then we have Giovanni Piccadella Mirandola. So he was, he lived from 1463, so younger than, younger than Ficino, and eventually he comes over and studies under Ficino, but he dies in Italy. So he dies young. He dies at the age of 31, so my age. Uh, he, he certainly accomplished more than I did. I mean, I wouldn't be as noteworthy as he is in history. But, again, speculated, but many people believe he was killed because he was caught sleeping with another man in Italy. Uh, was an Italian Renaissance nobleman and philosopher. He is famed for the events of 1486 when, at the age of 23, he proposed to defend the 900 theses on religion, philosophy, natural philosophy, and magic against all comers, for which he wrote the Oration on the Dignity of Man, which has been called the Manifesto of the Renaissance. And we will discuss that today, the Oration on the Dignity of Man. And so think about it. This Piccadilla Mirandola, who came from a wealthy family who was extremely well-educated, at the age of 23, wrote a book called The 900 Theses, in which he was willing, he brought any comment, he wanted debate. He, you know, come debate me. I got The 900 Theses, and I want to defend it. And he did that at the age of 23, and he was very successful. I mean, people were intimidated by his depth of knowledge. The manifesto, so again, the oration of the dignity of man, which I have a copy. Actually, I have it right here. The oration on the dignity of man by Giovanni Piccadilla Mirandola. Again, this is considered to be the manifesto of the Renaissance and a key text of Renaissance humanism and of what has been called the Hermetic Reformation. He was the founder of the tradition of Christian Kabbalah. Again, and you spell Kabbalah with a C-A-B-A-L-A. A key tenet of early modern Western esotericism, the 900 Theses was first printed book to be universally banned by the church. Okay, so this, this was the first one to be universally banned by the church. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get more of him. And then, of course, Isaac Casabone, if you weren't familiar, he's the one, he's the philologist that redates all this Corpus Hermeticum and totally changes the trajectory of some of the stuff. Okay, all right. So now we've got a lot of that stuff out of the way. Let me see how the chat's doing over here. Okay, guys, smash that like if you could. Smash that like. 
If you guys have just joined us, uh, we are diving into some Renaissance magic uh, right now. So, okay. So now I want to read to you guys this book. And we're going to be reading the chapter called The Italian Renaissance Magic and Kabbalah. So you see the Christian spelling of Kabbalah here. Now, what, what book is this? This is the Western Esoteric Traditions. The Western Esoteric Traditions by Goodrich, Nicholas Goodrich Clark. This is a great, a great book for an introduction to these topics. If you're not familiar and you want to learn more about this because of how influential this period is, uh, for example, this period plays a central role in my academic research, trying to argue for psychedelics as its own new religious movement and trying to paint what is the metaphysics, what is the epistemology, and what is the ethics um, <clears throat> what is the ethics um, of psychedelic spirituality, or what I call psychedelic esotericism, because I believe it comes out of this whole Western esoteric tradition. So looking at Neoplatonism and Hermeticism and how that re-enters into the Western mind plays central for how I believe even the use of psychedelics or inebriating substances, even opium use during the alchemical uh, 16th century, how this promotes and, and, and builds what I would call the psychedelic spiritual worldview, the paradigm. Again, and so... Now I'm going to read, the rest of this stream is going to be me reading this book, talking about the Italian Renaissance magic and Kabbalah. So again, bear with me. If you guys haven't, please smash that like. And now we're going to get into it. So the Byzantine legacy, that's the first thing we're going to discuss. The history of Western esotericism in the Middle Ages is largely one of exotic transmission. Following the sack of Rome in A.D. 410, the western part of the empire was engulfed by the mass migration of barbarian peoples, and the eastern Roman Empire of Byzantium, Constantinople, came, became the principal channel of classical and Hellenistic civilization. Hellenism had not only assimilated eastern ideas and religions, but also proved the most durable of all ancient cultures. By Arnold Tonybee's reckoning, the Hellenistic world passed through several eras, including the Ptolemies and the Roman Empire in the advent of Christianity. While the Latin West entered the Dark Ages, again, misnomer, uh, but certainly I would say the West was a little bit darker than the East. This is post-schism, no doubt, post-schism. Entered the Dark Ages, Byzantium still basked in the sunny climes of the Greek East and inherited the mantle of the Eternal City as the, quote, second Rome. Its pagan schools in Athens remained loyal to the Neoplatonists until the 6th century. As the major regional power across the Balkans, the eastern Mediterranean, and the Near East, Byzantium carried the torch of Alexandrian world culture for a millennium until the final onslaught of the Ottoman Turks from Central Asia in, sadly, a terrible date, 1453. So if you're Orthodox, 1453 is a year that we mourn, certainly. However, by the 6th century, the Arabs were an ascendant power on Byzantium's eastern flank. And this is true. So some of you guys have heard me talk about this famous book, the Jesus Sutras. So this is about the Church of the East, or really the Nestorian Oriental Orthodox Church, Oriental uh, Orthodoxy, which again has a Nestorian theology, which doesn't fully recognize the humanity of Christ. So naughty, naughty, naughty. But they were dominating. So uh, again, so 14, or 451, I'm sorry, is the Council of Chalcedon. This is where the Oriental Orthodox reject the, the humanity of Christ. Um, and uh, they reject the humanity of Christ, but it began to spread. So when we think of the Middle East, all the way over to China, again, you had the Silk Road, right? The Silk Road, uh, major trade going on between East and West. Oriental Orthodox, or the Church of the East, was, was spreading. And it wasn't until the rise of Islam that it totally wiped out the Christian Middle East. That was beginning to, it was a burgoning force. But Islam destroyed Oriental Orthodox. And I couldn't help but wonder, I was talking with somebody last night, 
You know, what if all that Oriental Orthodox, the Church of the East, was actually Eastern Orthodox? If they had the full revelation of Christ, would they have been better able to withstand the Muslims? I don't know. You know, Islam unified all these Arab tribes for the first time in history, just like Eastern Orthodoxy unified so many of the Slavic tribes for the first time in their history. But I don't know. It's a sad time. Sad time. Anyways. However, by the 6th century, the Arabs were an ascendant power on Byzantium, Byzantium's eastern flank, where they settled in the Middle East and Egypt. Confronted by the ancient and mysterious cultures of Egypt and Chaldea, Arabian culture swiftly assimilated the esoteric sciences of astrology, alchemy, and magic, all based on ideas of correspondences between the divine, celestial, and earthly spheres, as above, so below. The Arabs were also fascinated by the figure of Hermes Trismegistus, and they produced their own hermetic literature with revelations of theosophy, astrology, and alchemy. The most famous example, the Emerald Tablet. So I'm sure some of you guys who are also into the occult like I was, you know, you know the Emerald Tablets, you know who Thoth is, introduced the motto, as above, so below, which would become well known to the Western world after the 14th century. Michael uh, Sellis, a Byzantine Platonist of the 11th century, used Hermetic and Orphic texts to explain the scriptures. A notable number of medieval scholars, including Theodoric of Chartres, Albertus Magnus, Alan of Lyle, William of... Oh, jeez. Averne? I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the French words. Uh, Roger Bacon, Bernard of Treviso and Hugh of St. Victor also mentioned Hermes Trismegistus or quoted the Asclepius, the only hermetic treatises known to medieval Europe. Although condemned by church authorities, astrology, alchemy, and ritual magic were all practiced in medieval Europe. Meanwhile, scholastic theology was incredibly, increasingly divorced from natural philosophy. The growing interest in nature and the sensible world, together with the foundation of the universities and secular study, created an intellectual space within which Platonism and the Hermetica could be re received in the Latin West. Geopolitical factors in the Mediterranean world and the Near East played a vital part in this process of cultural transfer. As the ascendant Ottoman Turks succeeded, the medieval Arab caliphates as the dominant regional power in the Middle East, they increasingly impinged on the old Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire, which had been the major political and cultural force in southern Europe, in southeastern Europe and Anatolia since the fall of Rome. As the Turks pressed on westward across the Greek islands and into the Balkans, the territory of Byzantium began to dwindle. The rich repository of classical Greek and Arab learning, formerly the powerhouse of the Byzantine cultural sphere, also began to, swift west, to shift westward through the movement of refugee intellectuals, churchmen, libraries, manuscripts, and other treatises. The, this increased contact with the Greek world of the declining Byzantine Empire in the 15th century brought with it significant philosophical shift in the Latin West which in turn produced a revised outlook on nature and the heavens and ultimately a new vision of man, science, and medicine. This shift in philosophy favored Plato over Aristotle, whose works had formed a, the mainstay of medieval thought and science following their introduction to the Arab world in the 11th and 12th centuries. Now, the importance of Florence. The center of this revival of Platonism was Florence, the flourishing Renaissance city which lay in the Tuscan plain, uh, Colisio Salutati, counselor of the or chancellor of the uh, Republic from 1375 until his death in 1406, played a major role in the establishing humanism as the new cultural fashion, thereby boosting Florence's importance throughout Italy. More specifically, he recognized the importance of the original Greek sources for a deeper understanding of Roman authors. In 1396, he persuaded the Florentine government to appoint Manuel. Chrysoloris, the leading Byzantine classical scholar to teach at the local university. The appointment created a nucleus of humanists who were able to pass on their skills to the next generation for the study and translation of ancient Greek literature. Thanks to Salatati's initiative, 
there were sufficient numbers of new Italian Hellenists to receive and articulate the new wave of Greek thought and letters that arrived in Florence from the Byzantine world. In 1438 through 1439, the Council of Ferrara moved in mid-session to Florence, as was held to discuss the reunion of the Eastern Church with Rome. Leading figures of the Byzantine delegation were Georgios Gemistos Plethon, of who we spoke about earlier, and John Basarion, the young patriarch of Nicaea. The elderly Plethon espoused a pagan Platonic philosophy that understood the ancient Greek gods as allegories of divine powers. Basarion, who later became a cardinal, composed a defense of Plethon and Platonism against the Aristotelian George of Trebizond and who had attacked Plethon's ideas. The ensuing wave of philosophical disputes together with their translation and discussion among the humanists of Florence prepared the ground for a major efflorescence of Platonism in the second half of the century. Wealth and patronage also played an important role in the Platonist revival of Florence. Caso de' Medici, who again we talked about, the leading mer the merchant prince of the Florentine Republic played a vital part in the Platonist revival. Building on the power and prestige of his father, Giovanni de' Medici, who realized an immense fortune through banking and trade, Cosimo effectively became the absolute ruler of Florence, while remaining a private citizen of a republic jealous of its liberty. But Cosimo demonstrated royal generosity in his patronage of the arts and letters. In addition to his magnificent palace in the city, he built villas at uh, Caregi, uh, Via Sole. I know I'm butchering the Italian, I'm sorry. And elsewhere. His ecclesiastical foundations were numerous, including the Basilica of Fiesole, the Church of San Lorenzo in Florence, and a hospice in Jerusalem for pilgrims. In the world of fine art, he was the patron of Donatello, uh, Brunelleschi, uh, Gib Gib <laughs> Gibriti, and Luca della Robbia, whose paintings and sculptures gave full expression to the color and vibrancy of the Renaissance world. Greek philosophy and learning were especially dear to Cosmo's heart. During the Council of Florence, he frequently entertained Plethon and was deeply impressed by his exposition of Platonist philosophy. Later, after the final collapse of Byz Byzantium to the Ottoman Turks in 1453, many learned Greek refugees from Constantinople found refuge in his palace. Thanks to Cosimo's interest in this Platonist stream of ideas from an exotic and waning world and his capacity for uh, munificent patronage, both Platonism and the Hermetica were cultivated and promoted by a gifted circle of young idealists at Florence. And so now we're going to get into Marsilio Ficino and the Hermetic Revival. So again, keep in mind, the author, Nick, uh, Nicholas Goodrick Clark, the author of this, uh, the Western Esoteric Traditions, he's coming at, he's much more sympathetic to this stuff than we are. So if you, if you hear me reading and you're like, dang, uh, sounds like almost a promotion of, that's not me, that's just this book. But again, I do recommend this book. It's a good introduction and overview of a lot of the Western Esoteric Traditions. Okay, next section now is Marsilio Ficino and the Hermetic Revival. Many Florentine thinkers had been attracted by Plethon's claims that all Greek philosophers could be harmonized and that a profound knowledge of Plato could become the basis of religious unity, the very subject under debate at the Council of Florence. But others were more receptive to ideas of a new spirituality. These seekers found in Platonism and the Hermetica an inspiration which promised far more than ecclesiastical concord. Prominent among these idealists were the young Florentine humanist called Marsilio Ficino, who, under Cosimo's auspices, became the chief exponent of his revived Platonism and the high priest of the Hermetic secrets within a new Platonic academy. The son of a physician, Marsilio Ficino first studied philosophy as part of his own medical studies. This, the curriculum at the university was still dominated by scholasticism, and the young Ficino was repelled by the naturalism of Aristotle. Its dry statement of material facts could not, say, could not slake his thirst for spiritual mystery, and its implicit denial of the immortality of the human soul struck at the very root of his search for divine inspiration. 
In Plato's idea of two coexisting worlds, a higher one of being that is eternal, perfect, and incorruptible, a sharp contrast to the material world, Ficino found precisely what he had sought. The higher world of ideas or forms provided an archetypal pattern of everything that existed on the lower mundane plane, as above, so below. The human soul originated at the higher world, but it is trapped in the body in the lower world. Again, you can see that Platonic framework. And Plato's writings sometimes describe the return or ascent of the soul to its true and perfect home. The patron found the idealist. By 1456, Marcillo Ficino had begun to study Greek with a view to examining the original sources of Platonic philosophy, and he translated some text into Latin. By 1462, Cosimo had given Ficino a villa in Caregi and commissioned him to translate a number of Greek manuscripts. But the new spirituality soon recruited Hermeticism alongside Platonism. Just as Ficino was preparing to translate numerous Platonic dialogues for his master, new Greek wonders arrived in the East. In 1460, a monk, Leonardo de Pistoia, arrived in Florence from Macedonia with a Greek manuscript. Cosimo employed many agents to collect exotic and rare manuscripts for him abroad, and this one was such delivered. However, his particular manuscript contained a copy of the Corpus Hermeticum, gleaning something of its mystical cosmology, the elderly Cos Cosimo was convinced that the Hermetica represented a very ancient source of divine revelation and wisdom. In 1463, Cosimo told Ficino to translate the Hermetica before continuing his translation of Plato. Within a few months, Ficino had made the translation that Cosimo was able to read. Until as late as 1610, the works collected as the Hermetica were believed to date far back beyond their actual composition and to the two first centuries A.D. Ficino and his successors, successors regarded Hermes Trismegistus as a contemporary of Moses, and his teachings were seen as a philosophia perennis, a perennial philosophy predating yet anticipating Christianity with its roots in Pharaonic Egypt. The diffusion of these ideas can readily be illustrated, even in the church. Pope Alexander the, uh, the Sixth had the Borgia, or Borgia apartments in the Vatican adorned with a fresco full of hermetic symbols and astrological signs. And the entrance of the Siena Cathedral, that's the one I was talking about at the beginning of this stream, is the Siena Cathedral has in a Catholic cathedral has a huge marble layout of Hermes Trismegistus. It's it's a, it's really really like surprising, right? Inside of a church, inside of a Catholic cathedral, you have uh, basically a veneration of Hermes. Okay, one can still see in a work on the marble floor dating from 1488 the figure of Hermes Trismegistus as a bearded patriarch. Renaissance writers also regarded the Hermetic treaties as unique memorials of Prisca Theologia, the ancient theology, in the sense of the divine revelation granted to the oldest sages of mankind and handed down through a great chain of initiates. It was generally agreed that Hermes Trismegistus was a principal among these ancient sages, together with Moses, Orpheus, Zoroaster, Pythagoras, and others in varying orders of descent. After translating the Hermetica, Ficino resumed work on Plato and Cosimo. Uh, on, uh, I'm sorry, Ficino resumed work on Plato, and Cosimo was able to read ten of Plato's dialogues before his death in 1464. Ficino completed his translation of the collected works of Plato, the first into any Western language, in 1469, and in the same year he wrote his famous commentary on Plato's Symposium. From 1469 to 1478, he worked on his own chief philosophical work, Platonic Theology. In late 1473, he became a Catholic priest, and he later held a number of ecclesiastical benef uh, benefices, or, yeah, benefices, eventually becoming a canon of, Florence, of the Florence Cathedral. About the same time, he began to collect his letters, which give valuable insights into his life and activities over the next 20 years and include some smaller works of philosophy. After 1484, he devoted himself 
to his translation and commentary of Plotinus, the leading Neoplatonist of antiquity, which was published in 1492. Although he lived a contemplative life as a scholar and priest, Ficino had a far-reaching influence on the world of Renaissance thought. Encouraged by Cosimo, he had already founded a new Platonic Academy and his villa in Correggi by 1463. Unlike a formal college, the academy functioned chiefly as a loose circle of friends inspired by the spiritual ideas of Platonism and the Hermetica. Accounts of the, its activities indicate Ficino's desire to found a lay religious community with discussions, orations, and private readings of Plato and other texts with younger disciples. Plato's birthday was celebrated with a banquet at which each participant made a philosophical speech. Public lectures on Plato and Plotinus were held in a nearby church. Humanists and others distinguished adherents from Italy and abroad frequented the academy, and Ficino kept up an extensive correspondence with them. But what was Ficino actually teaching at the academy? What was so novel and exciting about this newfound spirituality based on the new reception of Platonism and the Hermetica? The answers to these questions lie in Ficino's cosmology and the role in that he assigned to the human soul. His model of the universe was derived from Neoplatonic and medieval sources, essentially a great hierarchy in which each being has its assigned place and degree of perfection. God was the top of its hierarchy, which descended through the orders of angels, the planets, and the elements to various species of animals, plants, and minerals. This cosmology itself, the historical product of ancient and medieval speculation, had long remained essentially static. Within the hierarchy, each degree was merely distinct from the next by some gradation of attributes. Through his platonic emphasis on the soul as the messenger between two worlds, Ficino introduced a new dynamic into traditional cosmology. He revived the Neoplatonic doctrine of the world's soul to suggest that all parts and degrees of the hierarchy were linked and held together by the active forces and affinities of, all, of an all-pervading spirit. In his scheme... Astrology was intrinsic to a natural system of mutual influences between the planets and the human soul. But prime of place was granted to the human soul in Ficino's cosmology. Ficino taught that thought had an influence upon its objects. Again, you see this in Neoplatonism and Hermeticism. In Plato's Symposium, Socrates identifies love as an active force that holds all things together. Ficino attributed the active influence of thought and love to the human soul, which could reach out and embrace all things in the universe. This magical equivalence between each human soul and the world soul, Neoplatonism, thus became the hallmark of Renaissance Neoplatonism. By placing the human soul like a droplet of divinity at the center of the universe, Ficino initiated a fundamental spiritual revolution in man's self-regard. Within this dynamic cosmology, the soul thus combined in itself everything, knew everything, and possessed the powers of everything in the universe. This cosmology was not a formal intellectual model, but rather a map for the travels and ascent of one's soul. In his emphasis on the inner contemplative life, Ficino gave a personal and practical slant to his theory of the soul. Through meditation, Ficino believed, the soul exchanged its commerce with the mundane and material things of this outer world for a few contact with the spiritual aspects of the incorporeal and intelligible world of higher planes. Such spiritual knowledge is unobtainable as long as one's soul is enmeshed in ordinary experience and the noisy concerns of this troubled world. In these lower states of consciousness, the soul is barely awakened. But once the attention is directed inward, the soul begins to ascend the spiritual hierarchy of the cosmos, all the while learning and interacting with higher spiritual entities. Huh. Ficino always presented these mystical exercises and ascent experiences as journeys of the soul toward higher degrees of truth and being, culminating in direct knowledge and vision of God. Now, you have to remember, guys, that this uh, in Orthodox, remember, what was it, the last one on... Uh, I think, yeah, it was the last stream on a holy guardian angel that we talked about um, that in orthodoxy, our focus should not be on the imagination or on experience, both of which take a primal importance in this renaissance magic and 
Kabbalic revival, this Neoplatonic and Hermetic revival in Western Europe, the imagination becomes the mediator. This is how you contact the higher spiritual realms. And this whole basis, as we just highlighted, that you, you, you almost venerate your own personal experience because it's through personal experience that you come to know God. Sounds like the New Age, because this is where they get it. This is where they get it. By the way, guys, um, smash that like if you just joined and you haven't. Please smash that like. Always greatly appreciate it. Okay. This initiatory aspect of Ficino's philosophy certainly helps to explain the intense attraction his ideas held for the Academy's audiences. His listeners felt their souls were being invited to join in a cosmic voyage of spiritual exploration, an ascent toward the Godhead, and a vision of universal truth. Ficino never doubted that his thought was Christian. I mean, clearly it was not, but you can see due to the influence, again, of 13th century Spain and moving forward of Islamic mysticism, Jewish Kabbalah mysticism, Christian mysticism fusing together that the Prisca Theologia, that they believed all this stuff was Christian. It all goes together. For him, Jesus Christ was the exemplar of human spiritual fulfillment. Arianism. Arianism, right? So we see Ficino, who becomes a Catholic priest. His Christology is Arianism. It's Arianism. He just believes Christ, Jesus Christ is the ex exemplar of spiritual, because this is all about apotheosis. And again, I think this is the problem with the West, because they don't have theosis as, as a spiritual doctrine. They worship themselves. They worship man. <clears throat> His Christianity was, of course, a more esoteric, elite, spiritualized form of religion than that proffered to the credulous masses by the friars. Ficino saw himself as a physician of the soul. Incorrect. Christ is the physician of the soul. You see, again, the, the Renaissance humanism from, a, from an Orthodox Christian perspective is they start taking that which should be attributed to Christ and attributing it to themselves. Apotheosis instead of theosis. Guiding his students on a path that could free them from the dross of this world and open their spirits to the dazzling radiance of divinity. Natural and spiritual magic. Next section. Ascent experiences implied wisdom. Again, focus on phenomenology and experience. Orthodoxy, we do not do this. But magic of the Hermetica offered power over nature. Ficino was deeply impressed by the hermetic treatises known as the Asclepius, in which ancient Egyptian priests described how to make the common people believers in the gods. They invested their statues with divine properties. Ficino comments that he once, like Aquinas, had thought this something demonic. Now following Hermes Trismegistus and Plotinus, he thinks of this process as a channeling of celestial powers or virtues inherent in herbs, trees, stones, and fragrances, which are themselves emanations of the divine. Thus, the principle of magic is indivisible, indivisible from Neoplatonic cosmology in which the power of the Godhead is diffused, emanationism, from its point of origin through a hierarchy of planes, emanationism, in which each piece of creation assimilates a virtue that defines it and is special to itself. Fichian magic or spiritual magic is preeminently astrological with its occult virtues in all things and creatures resonate primarily with the virtue of their governing star or planetary body. The successful magician who wishes to capture the power of Venus must therefore know what plants belong to Venus, the appropriate stones, materials, and other objects, and bring all these to bear in an invocation of the planet. The magician should know the signs of Venus and how these are to be marked on talismans made of Venus, materials and that are suitable to the astrological time of Venus. Ficino made widespread use of this form of sympathetic magic. Again, the law of correspondences. We've talked about this in previous streams. His major treatises on the subject, they, they Vita uh, Colitis Compranada, was recommended especially to scholars whose book learning and concentration render them susceptible to melancholy and the influence of Saturn. Again, all the astrology, it's, which is also the planet of the melancholy temperament and the star most opposed to the vital forces of youth. Ficino advises such melancholy subjects to avoid all contact with stones, herbs, plants, and animals under the sign of Saturn. Instead, 
They should expose themselves to plants, animals, and herbs belonging to a more fortunate, cheerful, and life-giving planet, the Sun, or Jupiter, or Venus. Ficino praises gold as a metal abundant in solar and jovial spirit, whose astral influences can greatly relieve melancholy. The color green is also beneficial in this respect, and, Finos, and Ficino suggests walks in the countryside where one may pluck roses, the golden flower of Jupiter. Or, or crocus, the golden flower of Jupiter. Francisco de Diaceto, a close disciple of Ficino, describes a Phoenician ritual in which the magician seeks a direct powerful channel of solar energies. Robed in a mantle of a solar color, such as gold, the subject should burn incense made from solar plants before an altar adorned with an image of the sun, enthroned and crowned, wearing a saffron cloak, appointed with unugent, Made from solar materials, his, he sings Orphic hymns to the sun. This concentration of solar properties and influences on the lower mundane world serves as a kind of lens to focus the solar influences from the higher astral world. The solar aspect of the various creatures, images, and artifacts attracts the downpouring of solar energy from the sun and concentrates it around the figure of the magician. Again, this is... Uh, Sympathetic magic. This is the law of correspondences. As above, so below. This is what he's practicing. And you can see by the reemergence of the Corpus Hermeticum in uh, Western Europe, they believe this stuff. This is like the truth. This is the ultimate revelation of God. D.P. Walker has shown how Ficino, of which I have that book. Um, where is that? Uh, I don't have it over here. It's uh, D.P. Walker's... Uh, from Ficino to Campanella, Spiritual and Demonic Magic. D.P. Walker has shown how Ficino was greatly concerned to distinguish his spiritual magic from the old-fashioned demonic magic of the medieval period. Ficino laid great emphasis on music for his theory of magic. He suggested that the physical medium of musical notes, air, resembled lightly embodied spiritual substances. As the strings of the lyre could resonate with the cosmic tones of planets and stars, so the magus could communicate with the celestial powers through music. In Ficino's view, the kind of spiritual magic was quite distinct from the demonic magic practiced by magicians through invocations to non-human agents, conjuration. However, there remained a tension in Ficino's theory. As he sang Orphic hymns and accompaniment to his music, he also believed that demons, both good and bad, were associated with the planets and their constant influence on the human body, spirit, and soul. Ficino's ideas of sympathetic magic indicated a new relationship between man and nature. Just as the Neoplatonic scheme of divine inspiration from God through the hierarchies of creation created a ladder of being, so man was a microcosm who combined within himself all the powers, virtues, and properties of the natural world, or macrocosm around him. The immediate position of the human soul and the latter of being thus enabled man to interact with intention and design upon the natural world. Marsilio Ficino affected a major revival of Neoplatonism and Hermeticism in his time. His doctrines of the soul and sympathetic magic opened up a new vista of the cosmos and man's ability to channel the powers of nature for his own benefit, which is the basis of magic, right? It's about the worship of man's own desire. As Ficino lectured and conducted magical rites at his academy, his audiences eagerly embraced the promise of spiritual elevation and communion with astral powers. Next section. Uh, next section is Pico della Mirandola and the Kabbalah. Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, a young contemporary of Ficino, developed an even more powerful variety of Renaissance magic by introducing the Jewish Kabbalah into Western thought. Pico's wealth, nobility, and personal charm and handsome face had combined with his precocious brilliance and early death to make him one of the famous figures of the Renaissance. Unlike Ficino, the retiring cleric and scholar, Pico led a, ver a varied life within the few years granted to him. And again, it's believed that he was actually killed for being discovered to have a sexual relationship with another man. Pico, uh, his ambitious claims of, for Renaissance magic initially brought him into conflict with various theologians, and his work was condemned by Pope Innocent. 
He is more. He is most famous for his oration on the dignity of man, uh, which was published in 1487, which proclaims the centrality, importance, and freedom of man in the universe. Pico was a younger son in the family of counts of Mirandola and Concordia, he, who ruled as feudal lords over a small territory in northern Italy. Destined by his mother for a church career, he was named papal uh, pro protonotary at the age of 10 and began to study canon law in Bologna in 1477 at age 13. Two years later, he commenced the study of philosophy at the University of Fer Ferrara, subsequently moving in 1482 to the University of Padua, one of the leading Aristotelian centers. Here he was the pupil of a Jewish philosopher, surprise, surprise, Elia del Medigo. At this time, he was in touch with humanist scholars in different places, and he visited Florence repeatedly, where he met Ficino. He spent the following years at home on various visits while continuing the study of Greek. In 1486, he returned to Florence, but after becoming involved in a strange love affair, he moved to Perugia where he studied Hebrew and Arabic under the guidance of several Jewish scholars, including the mysterious Flavius Mithridates, or Mithridates, or Mithridates. This period marked the beginning of his interest in Jewish Kabbalah, a medieval mystical and speculative tradition that claimed an ancient origin, but was in fact much influenced by Neoplatonism. Pico's Christian Kabbalah, the Latin term, again, that, that's about the different spelling as I was highlighting earlier was based on the tradition developed by Jews in Spain during the Middle Ages. Although the Jews were not finally expelled from Spain until 1492, the persecution of the Catholic authorities there had already encouraged many to flee to France and Italy. Pico learned that Kabbalah direct from the Spanish Jew Flavius Mithridates and others. This cultural transfer of Jewish wisdom from the West comparable to the earlier import of Greek learning from the East enabled Pico to immerse himself in the Jewish mystical and magical system. This medieval Jewish Kabbalah was based on the ten Sephiroth and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The doctrine of the Sephiroth was first laid down in the Book of Creation, dating back to the 3rd century A.D., when Greek Jews were also receptive to the Neoplatonist currents of late antiquity. In the 12th and 13th centuries, a particular esoteric teaching emerged in Provence and northern Spain with the Book of Illumination, composed by Isaac the Blind. This Kabbalah interpreted the, Sephir the Sephiroths as powers of God arranged in a specific structure. The Bahir was the first text to describe the Sephiroth as a tree of emanation. And again, so you can see emanationism, they're getting this from the Neoplatonic tradition. Emanationism is the cosmology of the Neoplatonic paradigm, which from the 14th century onward was depicted in a detailed diagram widely familiar today known as the tree of life. The Bahir was what also aided the development of the speculative Kabbalah based on the Sephiroth as cosmic principles arranged in a primal group of three major emanations above a lower group of seven. The doctrine was developed further in the Book of Splendor, written in Spain during the 13th century, which represents the tradition adopted by Pico. The Sephiroth are the ten names or expressions of God, and the created universe is seen as the external manifestation of these forces. You can see some similarities with even um, the chakra system to a degree. <clears throat> this creative aspect of the Sephiroth links them to cosmology. And there is a relationship between the ten Sephiroth and the ten spheres of the cosmos composed of the spheres of the seven planets, the sphere of fixed stars, and the higher spheres beyond these. The ten Sephiroth are arranged in a cosmological system known as the Tree of Life whose structure provides for 22 pathways between the various spheres. These pathways correspond to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but also denote angels or divine spirits which act as intermediaries throughout the system and are themselves arranged in hierarchies. Similarly, there are also good, bad, good and bad angels or demons organized in hierarchies corresponding to the good opposites. Jewish Kabbalistic mysticism was also connected with the scriptures through three kinds of exegetical techniques based on manipulations of the words and letters of the Hebrew text, known as 
gematria. So that is the sort of magical use of numbers in a, a sort of an interpretive lens. Notocarion and the uh, Themura. These ideas derive from the Ganat Egos or the Garden of Nuts, written in 1274 by the Castilian Joseph ben Abraham uh, Gikatila, who had introduced an ecstatic Kabbalah whereby the Sephiroth led on the mystical contemplation to the divine names of the Creator. These exercises were typically mystical. But there is also a magical side to Kabbalah. As a means of approaching the Sephiroth, 72 angels could be invoked by a person who knew their names and numbers. And these were also efficient if Hebrew words, letters, or signs were suitably arranged. Pico discerned a wonderful symmetry between the Kabbalah and Hermeticism. The Egyptian lawgiver Hermes Trismegistus had revealed mystical teachings, including an account of creation which hinted at his knowledge of Moses' wisdom. Again, which was an error. In Pico's view, the Kabbalah offered a further body of mystical doctrine supposedly derived from the Hebrew lawgiver and a parallel view on cosmology. Armed with a great number of knowledge of Hebrew, than any, or more so than any other non-Jewish scholar of his time, and his burning interest in Kabbalah, Pico set down a new synthesis of hermetic Kabbalistic magic in his 26... In, in 26, quote, magical conclusions. Here, Pico dismissed medieval magic as the work of the devil, but praised natural magic <laughs> as a legitimate establishment of the links between heaven and earth by the proper use of natural substances as recommended by the principles of sympathetic magic. He went on to recommend Orphic incantations for magical purposes, of which, again, Marsilio Ficino was already noted for using. He was very much interested in the, in the Orphic, uh, Orphic incantations. Evidently referring to Ficino's magic, whose practices he already knew well through the academy at Florence. Flushed with confidence in the powers of Kabbalah, Pico then described the limitations of Ficino's practice. Pico regarded Ficino's natural magic as a weak and ineffective form of magic unless it was combined with Kabbalah, Christian Kabbalah. Similarly, he held no powerful magic could be performed without the knowledge of Hebrew and even dismissed the Orphic singing for magical operations in the absence of Kabbalah. In his Kabbalistic conclusions and quote, apology of 1487, Pico distinguishes between various forms of Kabbalah. There's speculative Kabbalah. He divides into four types. First, the mystical manipulation of letters, followed by the exploration of the three worlds, the sensible or terrestrial world, the celestial world of the stars, and the super celestial world of the Sephiroths or the angels. These latter categories were of prime importance to Pico's magic. Pico asserts that this kind of Kabbalah is a, quote, way of capturing the powers of superior things, unquote, and is, quote, the supreme part of natural magic, unquote. Whereas natural magic aims no higher than the terrestrial world and the stars, Kabbalah can be used to operate beyond the celestial spheres of the angels, archangels, and the sephiroth of God. Natural magic uses characters, but Kabbalah uses numbers through its use of letters. Natural magic uses only intermediary causes, the stars. Kabbalah goes straight to the first cause, God himself. Pico elaborates in his apology how Kabbalists may use the secret Hebrew names of God and names of angels, invoking them in the powerful Hebrew language or the magical combinations of the sacred Hebrew alphabet. Just as there are superior spirits on these higher planes, higher spiritual beings, great demons also inhabit these regions. Pico solemnly warns the Kabbalists to work in a spirit of piety. In his 72 Kabbalistic conclusions, Pico demonstrates his detailed knowledge of the Jewish system. He writes that the Kabbalists can communicate with God through the archangels in an ecstasy. Again, you, you notice this importance on, on experience, ecstatic places, the imagination, all of which, again, orthodoxy condemns. Um.
that the ecstasy that may result in the death of the body, a way of bringing known the death of the kiss. And so you see the Platonism because the Platonism always rejects the body because, again, the body being materialistic is, is a further emanation away from the great center, the divine center, the, the ethereal energy of God, right? So, hey, guys, smash that like if you guys can. If, you, if anybody just joined, uh, smash that like. We're almost through this reading. Again, if you guys want, we're doing a theology course at 7 o'clock p.m. Zoom meeting. Join the Codal group chat if you want to join. He sets out a table which shows the correspondences between the ten spheres of the cosmos and the ten sephiroth. He also describes the state of the soul in relation to the meanings of the ten sephiroth, such as unity, intellect, reason, and traditionally links the highest sephiroth with the lowest in a circular arrangement. All right, last section here. We just have two more pages and then we're done. Last section is on the oration on the dignity of man. Oration on the dignity of man. This is, again, the famous book that Giovanni Picandella writes, Picandella uh, Marandola writes before he's killed. Pico's famous oration on the dignity of man was written as an introduction to his 900 theses, which he took with him to Rome in 1486 in order to engage in a great public debate. The oration was rightly, has rightly been regarded as a masterpiece of rhetoric, celebrating the newfound independence and confidence of Renaissance man. Pico's statement marks the sea change between the medieval mind and the modern mind. The tremendous growth in man's sense of autonomy and dignity, which had grown up with humanism, which was, a, again, we talked about the worship of man himself, Renaissance humanism. The oration also rejects as inadequate the traditional grounds for man's importance in the world, his reason or his place as the microcosm. Pico claims that man's true greatness lies in the freedom to become whatever he wants to be. Both animals and angels have their fixed place in the universe and are powerless to change their natures. But God gave man alone and all creatures no fixed abode, form, or function. Free of such limitations, he has the power to change and develop and make himself and mold himself. Now we see right there, again, psychedelics dissolve boundaries and magic itself is a sort of transgression of boundaries. And it's so, you know, you hear man as the microcosm. Well, as Orthodox theology, we, you know, in a way we can understand this. We could say, okay, well, that's not, that's not too crazy. But the, these, these then subtle, these subtle different interpretations and misunderstandings lead to very, very uh, uh, negative places theologically and philosophically speaking. And we see the same recapitulation of these ideas in contemporary New Age ideas, uh, neo neo paganism, modern day stuff, and all that. So, what was the ultimate goal of man's existential freedom? Imagining God addressing Adam, Pico attributes to man the power to be reborn into the higher forms. Again, a misunderstanding of theosis because the West didn't have this doctrine. Pico opens the oration with the quotation, quote, A great miracle, Asclepius is man. Whereas the fathers of the church had placed man in a dignified position as the highest of terrestrial beings, yes, as a spectator of the universe, Pico was citing the hermetic text, the Asclepius, with its promise of man's equality with the gods. You see, you see the worship of mankind elevates man to the status of divinity itself. This is the great sin. This is the Luciferian pride of his great fall. Quote, man is a miracle, a living thing to be worshipped and honored. No, for he changes his nature into gods as if he were a god, <coughs> conjoined to the gods by a kindred divinity. He despises inwardly that part of him in which he is earthly, unquote. Wrong, wrong. You see, again, so subtle, so subtle that the West, because it doesn't have theosis, falls into the worship of man and Renaissance humanism and then the apotheosis of magical thinking, elevating mankind to the status of God, to the status of God. It happens over and over again. 
Introducing the contents of his 900 theses, Pico ranges over all the philosophers and mysteries he has studied. A keynote of his philosoph- of his Philosophia Nova is a attempt to establish a concordance or correlation between all ancient philosophies and support of a pristine Prisca theologia. Yes, exactly. Perennialism, the heresy of perennialism. A a tribute to his precocious learning, he was only 24, the names of the Latin Duns Scotus, Thomas Aquinas, Giles of Rome, Franciscus of uh, Maronis, Albertus Magnus, and Henry of Ghent are followed by the Arabs Avicenna, Averroes, and Al-Farabi. Further back among the ancient, he invokes the Greek peripatetics. That's the name of Aristotle's school where they walked around. And then the Neoplatonist Plotinus. He's the father of Neoplatonism. Porphyry, his student who wrote down everything in the Enneads. And Iamblichus, the student of Porphyry. And Proclus, the student of Iamblichus. At the very source of the ancient wisdom stand Pythagoras and Mercurius Trismegistus. Zoroaster and the Hebrew Kabbalist wise man, whose knowledge Pico asserts was later detected by Al Kindi, Roger Bacon, and William of Paris. However, the great themes of Magia and Kabbalah echo through the oration, the quote, ancient theology of Hermes Trismegistus, unquote, and the quote, occult mysteries of the Hebrews, unquote, offer the prime means of man's promotion to the divine realms. So again, You become God not by following Jesus Christ, which is the orthodox theology. You do it through magic. You do it through magic. Quote, as the farmer weds his elms to vines, even so does the magus wed earth to heaven. Mm -hmm. The oration alludes to esoteric knowledge known only to the few. Pico speaks of occult Hebraic law vouchsafed only to initiates, and he recalls the symbolism of the sphinxes of Egyptian temples, indicating that mystic doctrines should be kept secret from the common herd. Pico's subsequent career was turbulent. As soon as he published his 900 theses, several Roman theologians raised an outcry about their heretical character, and Pope Innocent appointed a commission to examine them. Pico was summoned to appear several times before this commission, and several of these he was condemned. Undaunted, in May of 1487, Pico published together with part of the oration an apologia defending his condemned theses. This challenge involved him in fresh difficulties, and bishops with inquisitorial powers were appointed to deal with his case. In July, Pico made a formal submission and retraction to the commission, and in August, the Pope issued a bull condemning all these as forbidding their publication. Lorenzo de' Medici, again the son of Cosmo de' Medici, interceded for Pico with the Pope, of course, because they were in favor of all this stuff. And Pico was thereafter permitted to live in Florence under Medici protection. On 17th of November of 1494, the day the armies of King Charles VIII of France entered Florence, Pico died of a fever, which is, again, speculated that it could have been lied about because some people believe he was murdered because he was sleeping with another man. He was 31. Ficino and Pico were seminal figures in the revival of Hermeticism, Neoplatonism, Magic, and Kabbalah in Renaissance Europe. Their interest in the power of sympathetic and Kabbalistic magic to affect changes in natural and nature signal a new appreciation of man's ability to operate on the mundane world through the knowledge and application of correspondences between the higher and lower worlds. As Francis Yates has suggested, this attitude anticipates the exploration and confidence of natural science. However, their emphasis on the hierarchy and spiritual intermediaries in the form of attributes, letters, numbers, and the transmission of the soul indicate that his philosophy of nature was intimately bound up with the religious experience and an approach to God. Renaissance magic was thence form considered a sacred science in Europe. So, as we can see, um, 
this was an extremely influential period in Western, uh, Western European history. We see the same problems with magical thought, the elevation of man to the status of God, the worship of mankind, uh, apotheosis. We see perennialism. We see a sort of relativism. We see, again, for them, the way that they got around the relativism is for them, they're saying that, well, you know, this uh, all because of the Prisca Theologia presupposition, they believed if it, the older it is, the better it is. And therefore, because this stuff was newer, it was not as true as the old philosophy, the, tr the old theology. And therefore, we had to mix max, mix max these things together to see the true revelation. So um, sad, 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 sad. But we can see how when we look at the New Age, when we look at psychedelic spirituality, when we look at many presuppositions of contemporary people, they believe this stuff, unfortunately. So... Uh, I think it's had a great influence on people, and uh, it's had major negative consequences. So, I'll see if there's any super chats. Uh, looks like there's no super chats. So, does anybody have any comments or questions? Um, um, uh, looking at the... Uh, uh, shout out to our good friend John Pro. Looks like he's in the live chat. Shout out John Pro. They think Christian cosmology is just superstition, but they project exactly John Pro. Um, that's the naivete Henley. They only understood the spiritual battle for the soul. Yep, they got roped by demons forever, right? They sure did. They sure did. You know the demons. The demons. Um, did them in so guys i want to highlight again this is only the first half i have a powerpoint that i'm going to share with you guys and go a little bit more in depth in regards to the ancient roots and in regards to all this renaissance magic if you'd like access to the second half of this very interesting topic you can do so with this link right here uh become a website member also Guys, we are doing a theology course tonight with Subdeacon Mark. If you'd like to learn more about Orthodox theology, ask specific questions about Orthodox theology, join the Codal group chat. We're going to be doing that here in 20 minutes at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be doing, again, our Orthodox the theology class, which is now open for the fourth week. This is only the fourth week that uh, I help Subdeacon Mark. Uh, this is a class we do at my parish, and we are going to be diving into Orthodox theology. If this is something you'd like to, to join, if this is something you'd like to participate in, totally free. Uh, all you have to do is go to my group chat, and I will post the link to join right before 7 o'clock. So if you'd like to participate in our Orthodox theological uh, meeting, which we do every Wednesday at 7 Make sure to do so um, through the Codal group chat. And you can do that with that Linktree link. So I got to get off here and I got to get ready for that class. So thank you, everyone. Please smash that like if you have not. Uh, smash that like. And again, if you'd like to have access to the second half of today's stream, which I'll get up probably Friday. Uh, probably Friday we'll have the second half of this stream up over at the website for members. So I will check you guys then. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And hopefully, if you guys are interested, I'll see you in our theology course. Check you out.